Uh, so, uh, good afternoon, good morning, uh, good evening, uh, all participants. Uh, this is the Healthy Soil, Healthy Food uh, Learning and Sharing session. And uh, we are happy to be having three presentations today from uh, Kasisi, uh, from Kasisi in Zambia. Uh, we will have uh, Paul. Um, we'll have a second presentation from uh, Chinika. We'll have Paul Muche, Mucheren, Muche, Mucheneripi. You will excuse me for that pronunciation. And lastly, we'll have a presentation from Granswell. Uh, it will be presented by Twamba. Uh, we encourage all participants to use the chats and um, at some point I will sample some of the questions and uh, where possible we'll ask uh, the participants to elaborate uh, uh, the question where needed and um, we welcome our first uh, presentation from Assisi. You have 15 minutes. Um, please uh, stick to your time and uh, I hope uh, all of us are going to have good sharing and uh, good learning. Uh, welcome, uh, Paul. Uh, thank you, Ferdinand. Uh, I'll try the um, um, the sharing. Uh, I've never done this before, but um, be able to try. So. Um, <clears throat> So this presentation is from Kasisi Agricultural Training Center in uh, uh, Zambia. Um, we're, uh, we promote uh, what we call sustainable organic agriculture. Are you seeing my slide? Yes, yeah. it's uh, visible. Yeah. Okay, that's okay. Uh, There's a picture of uh, the um, office block. A bit of the history of... Um, um, of, of Kasisi Agricultural Training Center. We um, started, uh, <clears throat> we're a faith-based organization owned and administered by the Society of Jesus or the Jesuits. Uh, started in 1974, with a two-year residential training for families. And at that time we were promoting this very good agriculture called industrial agriculture, fertilizers, hybrid seed, pesticides, tractor plowing, all these very good things. But, um, and then 1980, uh, we introduced an appropriate technology workshop uh, where we uh, did some uh, experimenting uh, with uh, ox rippers, treadle water pumps, box solar cookers, and we trained blacksmiths uh, over a six week course. And at the end of the six weeks, the blacksmiths were able to produce all the parts for um, ox equipment such as zigzag harrow, plows, cultivators, were able to make hoes and axes all in their, at their village. Uh, workshops. And uh, by 1990, I received a bit of a, uh, <clears throat> a metanoia, a change of heart, and I realized that we had to change our way of uh, agriculture. So we started experimenting with organic agriculture, uh, doing compost, teas, rotations, agroforestry. Am I going too fast? Okay. Paul, um, just okay. one quick thing, Paul. Maybe you could click on slideshow, uh, and then it's bigger. It's for people on their phones that they, they can see it more easily. Do you see slideshow? At the Where top? is that, John? Slideshow. It what? says slideshow at the top. If you click on that, I think it, it'll fill the whole screen. Um. Animations, and then it says slideshow. Is that it? Yeah, and if you click on that, I think it should fill the whole screen. Yeah. Is that better? Yeah, it's better for people on phones who have a small screen. Okay. Um, okay. Thank you for that. And then in 1995, we started offering five-day courses to farmers in um, organic agriculture. So we, we've been offering about 17 different various courses, all based on the principles of organic agriculture, such as uh, organic vegetable production, uh, dairying, agroforestry, beekeeping, and so on. Um, recently, we've been training trainers from government agricultural colleges 
uh, and working with them and developing manuals for them to use at their agricultural colleges. Uh, we've prepared many study circle manuals in organic agriculture. These are it's a, it's a adult uh, education methodology used in Sweden. And so 15 to 20 uh, farmers uh, or five to 15 farmers can meet together on a regular basis and go through these manuals and study on their own. We have a farm at uh, KATC, Cassis Agricultural Training Center, and we grow crops such as oats and we also have a small dairy and we add value to the oats and the milk. We do a lot of extension work, mainly in the Changwe and Rufunsa districts, which are districts adjacent to KATC. We do a lot of research and uh, in the rainy season, we set up demonstration plots across the country. Uh, this rainy season, we're working with 2000 farmers uh, in the Northern provinces and in, in central provinces in uh, uh, producing organic soybeans. There's, a, there's a, a market for organic soybeans in the country. In January of this year, we launched an online diploma in agroecology. It's a three year online program approved by the University of Zambia. The first 40 students are from uh, government that they're camp agricultural extension officers. Uh, they're starting in year two because they all have a certificate in agriculture. So we give them credit for the first year. Quite a change from um, 25, 30 years ago when I started uh, the program, I, I thought that we would uh, work with the camp extension officers, but at that time they had all studied the real agriculture. They, they thought that organic was a, a bit backwards. So they didn't, were not interested, but it's strange that like now the, um, at the uh, ministry level, uh, they want their af uh, officers to know about organic agriculture and the extension officers also want to learn. So it's a really uh, um, uh, a big plus. This was the cutting of the ribbon at the launch of the diploma. Uh, these are the, uh, the oat, um, rolled oats, the, the, the packaging we, we have and we sell in a supermarket uh, in, in Lusaka. And uh, these are the different cheeses and uh, yogurt that we make. We make uh, feta, halloumi, and moza mozzarella uh, cheese. Lusaka is 1,100 meters above sea level. Uh, and lowest point is 300 meters, rising up to 2,400 meters. Zambia has three main rivers, the Zambezi, the Kafui, and the Luangwa. And we have one rainy season from November to March. And in the valleys, they can expect between 300 to 500 millimeters of rain. Up in the north, over 1,200 millimeters of rain. And uh, where we are in Lusaka and most of the country, uh, between 500 to 800 millimeters. Some years we would even go up to 1,000 millimeters, but that's rare. The months of April to mid-August are cool to cold, windy, and dry. There can be a light frost for some nights, which is enough to damage banana leaves and tomatoes and even kill uh, beans. And then from mid-August to when the rains start, that's our hot and dry season. There are seven main language groups in the country. Traditionally, the food has been produced in Southern, Central, and Eastern provinces. When I say the traditional food is be mainly maize. Uh, the Western province is very sandy and have a lot of cattle. The Northwest province is um, uh, undeveloped in the sense of they haven't much uh, industrial agriculture there. So they're able to um, have a blanket certification of, uh, of, uh, the, of, the, uh, this, of the province and they produce a lot of organic honey for the export market. 85% of the population are Christians, 5% Muslims, and the balance are Hindus, animists, and Jews. The two principles most effectively implemented are uh, A, no chemical stress. So a lot of plant diversity, crop rotations, composting. And in the last few years, uh, farmers have really taken on to uh, producing bokashi and liquid fertilizers, and they're seeing the results, and they're very happy with that. Two weeks ago, I was in a village, and uh, a lady was very, very excited, and she wanted me to see one of her fields, and she called it a dead soil. And what she did this year, she um, mixed her uh, maize seed with the bioliquid fertilizer, so in other words, seed priming and planted and then the, the, the maize is growing. And so she just cannot believe this. 
And whenever people are walking by, she, she calls people in to show them this. She's so, so happy about it. But uh, another important point about this as well is that it's the biology that brings uh, life back to the soil. It's not the organic matter per se, because there is no organic matter there. It's just the, the priming of the seed with the, uh, with the biology. The healthy plants as one way of uh, managing pests uh, and the healthy plants is uh, by, by having a healthy soil. In our vegetable uh, gardens, we also do have hedgerows, planting things like uh, marigold, uh, interplanting vegetables. The um, last five, six years in the country, we've had the fall army warm and we control it with applying sand in the world of the maize. Also a lot of uh, plant diversity, I think it helps to control the moth. Uh, in the villages where uh, farmers are practicing organic uh, agriculture, they don't have much problem with the fall armyworm, but their neighbor, immediate neighbors who would have their whole farm in, in maize would have their crop could be devastated. So I think the plant diversity helps to um, maybe confuse the moth. And the years gone by, we also did a lot of organic cotton. And the way we did that was uh, inter rows of various species. So we have 10 rows of, of cotton and then three rows of, um, uh, of various species such as cowpeas, sunflower, sweet sorghum, dill, okra, sun hemp, sesame, coriander, and marigold. And maybe just a point there when the, cow, the, the aphids will go to the cowpeas rather than the cotton. But uh, every three weeks, it's important to plant new cowpeas because once the cowpeas start senescing, they will, the aphids will uh, revert to the cotton. Uh, this is one camp where the farmers have just received their um, uh, tools for making the bokashi and, and liquid fertilizer. This is the way they package it. There's another better picture there. Um, and they're, I'm not sure that they've started selling yet, but they're about to start selling. And this is the, an organic cotton field. There's a, a company in uh, Jinri in Kafui that has the um, approval by the cotton board to grow only organic cotton in Changwe, Rufunsa, and Longwe districts. This is, this is quite a, quite a po very positive thing. And um, so if we could get more of this type of, of um, approval by government, that certain districts could be uh, more organic. That would be a, 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 another way of promoting this um, AE. And the second um, uh, <clears throat> implement, imp uh, implementation that we're doing is the use of local seeds. And farmers are very proud to stand up and say that they're planting uh, 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 many local seeds. There's a growing interest in, in this, in these, uh, in this um, practice. So the, these would be open pollinated varieties of maize, uh, finger millet, sesame, local beans, cowpeas. Naturally, there's, a, there's an improved nutrition at the family level and the diversity of the plants uh, gives more rotations. Uh, the labor is, is divided uh, more evenly across the, 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 the growing season. There's an income increase and better cash flow because rather than sell just maize at one time, they're able to sell many uh, uh, um, crops uh, over many months. There's an improvement in soil fertility. And the farmers are also are very, very happy uh, that they have seed sovereignty, they, they own the seed. And they're, you can see that they're very happy about that. They share their seed at, at a seed bank and uh, so whatever amount they, they, they would uh, take at the beginning of the season, at the harvest time, they would bring back twice the amount. So to help to, to, to spread amongst more uh, farmers. The two principles that we're not addressing currently is the 365 days ground cover. And I think that that's something that we really want to make a, an effort at. Uh, farmers are planting two crops, but not multiple species. And I think in order to get this 365 days ground cover, we'll have to mix quite a few uh, species together. And I think the cover crops and no-till go hand in hand. And the second uh, principle that we're not addressing, which I, I would like to address would be no-till. So even things like the big heavy hand hose that uh, farmers are using, that's slicing and dicing the hyphae, the mycorrhizal fungi. 
and government is um, promoting mechanization, so the plowing and disking at uh, much wider areas, uh, and that 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 also destroys the hyphae, and certainly a, a remedy for at at um, hand uh, um, level would be the, the use of a hula hoe. Another farmer has been uh, using continuous ground cover of a mokuna or a velvet bean. You would plant his uh, maize and then twice during the growing season to, to control the growth of the velvet bean, he would slash it by hand. And uh, he's been doing this for about 15 years and he's getting about 16.8 tons of, of maize per hectare. The average in the country is uh, one and a half to two tons. So it's a huge, huge uh, improvement. So as I said, we want to, to start doing in March the, the uh, trials on going, going to working towards 365 days growing uh, plants. And the other big thing, which I, I think we have to reflect much more on, is the enculturation of this process. The, uh, in, in Andhra Pradesh, they're able to, to be, get big numbers. But in my opinion, they're enculturating this whole um, agroecology within their culture. And I think we, it's not only a matter of looking at the technology and showing that it works, but I think if, if we can enculturate this, uh, then we'll, 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 we can get the numbers. We have in Zambia, many NGOs and uh, faith-based organizations that are promoting agroecology. So it's a matter, I think at this point of showing a critical mass to government so that the FISIP subsidy program can include local seed on farm fertilizer production, improve hand tools, et cetera. FISIP is the farmer input support program and uh, it's, it, it uh, subsidizes fertilizer and hybrid maize seed. Now, commercial farmers are adopting these two practices of high density grazing and cover crops and planting green. The reason I'm, I'm, ta I'm uh, um, making this, uh, this one slide on commercial farmers is that um, policy makers look at the commercial farmers. They think that they're the, the, the epitome of agriculture. And so what they're doing, then this, this becomes policy for the small scale farmers. So the, the mob grazing or high density grazing is putting of cattle uh, bunch them up and, and you, by using an electric fence and uh, keeping, uh, keep moving them so that they, they, they would eat all the, 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 uh, the grasses and so on and then move on. So they're leaving their manure and, uh, and so on, on on that area. And within one to two years, that pasture becomes really, really lush. Uh, one NGO in the country has been working quite a bit on uh, with communal grazing. Uh, there are certainly challenges on that, but they've been successful in a few places. And the farmers are happy because their cattle uh, health is improved. And uh, also their pa the pastures are improving as well. They see that. Cover crops and planting green means planting maybe 15 to 20 species together in the field. And then when the, the cover crop is at boot stage to plant the maize or the soybeans, whatever it is, into that field. And then when the uh, cover crop comes to emphesis with the pollen shedding, then you, you roll and crimp it. Uh, so this is certainly being done uh, at large scale in North America, but the, the, the whole technology was developed by small scale farmers in South America. Uh, this is mob grazing. You can see uh, the cattle are uh, kind of confined to one area. And another area here, and this farmer has planted some Lucina, uh, rows of Lucina, so that in the future, the cattle will have the, the grass plus the Lucina for uh, protein. Uh, this is one of the small scale, small scale farmers, uh, uh, soybean uh, field that uh, this has been contracted to a, a large um, enterprise that's looking at, at buying uh, organic soybeans. On the left, you have two varieties of um, cowpeas intermixed. And then on the right, you can see beans and groundnut. And this is the field of groundnut and uh, beans interplanted at an early stage. These are three types of um, hula hose. So the idea is, is to just um, cut the weeds at ground level. So you don't dig into the ground. So you don't uh, disturb the hyphae of the mycorrhizal fungi. Maybe I should mention that the, 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 the hyphae is a, is a whole network and that's the way the fungi and bacteria bring the nutrients to the plants. So every time we, we um, break that hyphae, 
then the, the fungi have to, to rebuild that network. So it takes time. So the farmer is, 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 is making a, a disservice to himself or herself by cultivating. There's another hula hole and, and a wheel hole. So thank you. Thank you, Paul. And uh, you've done it well. I did not uh, interrupt. I gave you some uh, four minutes. And uh, we, we, we say old is uh, gold. I respect age. Um, thank you so much. Uh, there are some few questions and uh, clarification. Uh, thank God you've um, shown the hula ho. And uh, um, Paul just wanted to see and to know what a hula ho is. And could I just uh, also ask, is this a traditional tool or... Um, is it uh, something that was brought in? And then you will uh, also explain what is uh, to inculturate. Welcome, Paul. Okay, so a hula ho uh, is certainly known in Europe. It's, it's, it's an old technology. Um, so these uh, hoes that we have here at Cassisi, we brought them in from, uh, from Poland, but uh, years ago we had brought in some in from the USA. So that it's it's a technology that's known, but it's not it's not known uh, here in, in the country. But I think it's something that, that should be promoted. And um, the the enculturation, I, I by enculturation I mean that should okay the way I I can see it in but it, it has not been well explained in Andhra Pradesh. But it's I think it's part of their um, their their whole. Um, worldview and it includes their, their their faith, their religion. At one point, I did ask the question when when they were presenting uh, about when they <clears throat> about about the, the 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 how the whole process is, and they said that when they go, the farmer goes to the field to his or her field. The first thing they do is is offer a little prayer. So it's all part of their religion, their faith, and their their conversation within the family and so on so so somehow we we have i think we we have to incorporate that in into our uh world view no it's gonna that will take some time it's not it's not an easy thing but it's so it's not a, a you know we can show uh, technically that this is good that you, that you can double quadruple your yields but for you know farmers are still not adopting in big numbers how you know how and I, I think if it can be enculturated um within part of the the culture of 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 of, of, the, of the people there's, there's much better chance of success that's what i mean by that uh thank you i think we'll have to keep that in mind uh when we're thinking about our next uh, uh sessions with the, the Andhra Pradesh group because we expect to be sharing about the social dimensions how they have uh, succeeded and uh I think with our previous um, uh, presentation, we had a lot about uh, uh, the role of religion in um, incorporating some of the principles and understanding and uh, doing some of uh, the things that they're doing there. Uh, thank you so much. Um, then uh, you did mention, or you had some pictures on uh, packaging uh, biofertilizers or biostimulant. How did this uh, work with the government the standards and uh, how does it work uh, in your situation? Okay, so the one farmer has really moved forward on it uh, on his own. He's, he's gone and gotten the, the approval um, from, from um, the, the Zambia uh, Bureau of Standards. Now, I, I don't know much more than that at, at this point, Fernand, uh, except that, that uh, I think it's, it, they, they can go ahead and sell it. Uh, the, I don't know that there's much written on, on, the, um, on the packaging, but you can see that they, they've done, the farmers themselves have <laughs> really gone into it. And the, the, um, the, 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 certainly the, the um, government people at the, at the district level are really enthused and happy with 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 this, and 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 farmers are coming to the to the um, to these camps where they're making this uh, uh, fertilizer and wanting to buy. So um, so so th so there's you know that that's kind of going on its own without our intervention. 
Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. And uh, I think we'll have some time towards the end for any other clarification or any other question. I encourage our um, participants to use the chats and I will sample some of the questions and uh, we'll ask the speakers to do a uh, uh, clarification. Now we move on to our second uh, presentation. I hope uh, Paul uh, Muchin Muchinerepi, if you are ready, uh, kindly you, you have the floor. Um, th thank you, people. Uh, yes, um, I, I represent Chinika communities, which are based in the southern part of, of Zimbabwe, uh, in the Gutu district. And I'm going to share with you the slides, which are the basis of my presentation. With me here, I have a colleague, uh, Rodney, and she is using Mrs. Jenner's uh, computer. He is going to help me move on with the slides while I concentrate on, on the um, explanation. Rodney, can, can we share the screen? Yes. What's the problem? I'm sharing the screen. Tina? You can't see it. I can't see it here. Yeah. Can you ask if they can see me? Can can you see our, our screen? We can see the, the screen, but we need to you need to open up the PowerPoint. Yes. What, what, what? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sharing the screen. Oh I don't see I don't see it here. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, no, that's fine. That's fine. Thank you, thank you. I think it's uh, visible. It's visible now. Thank, thank you so much. Um, the format of my presentation is um, on each slide, I've tried to put pictures which tells the story of our activities, and I would explain. Um, um, what each slide is all about. On the first slide there, you can see the three pictures there, which represent some of our major activities. Um, the first one to your left, our farmers had gone to Porridge, uh, which is one of our sister organizations in the Eastern District on an exchange visit. And they were looking at um, land regeneration and so on. The middle one um, speaks about the use of uh, biofertilizer, uh, bokashi, in our finger millet. Finger millet is our major crop. Um, I think it's now our staple crop in the Chinyika area. And then there's the kettle, um, which also is now one of our major activities. Move on to the next one. That Gutu, as I said earlier on, is situated uh, in the southern part of um, Zimbabwe, in Mashingo province. Gutu has got 44 wards, and we've got about 33,000 families. And the total population is about 200,000 people. Um, and is one of the driest regions of, of Zimbabwe. Um, our rainfall, between 200 and 400 millimeters per year. And crops like maize usually fail. Like this year, maize is going to fail. And that crop that you see is finger millet, um, which has really proved to be the crop that we need to concentrate on if we need to put food on the table for the communities. It's one of the best crops that we had. It was last year um, and that farmer is demonstrating um, his crop. Next one. Next. We started looking at um, food security for the family livelihood. And we started in about 2005, 2006. Um, really, it, we started as a loose formation of farmers who were really trying to uh, fight a shortage of food for the family livelihood. 
And of course, it, discussing what was causing hunger, what was causing shortage of food, um, the elders came up with a solution and said in the past, before the introduction of maize, uh, people were growing finger millet. And uh, finger millet is a crop that is given to us by nature um, that had a good reason, a good chance of succeeding, even when we have about 200 millimeters of rain or even less. So they started encouraging people to start growing finger millet. On the left, you can see there is a crop of maize, which really is not doing well. And then there's a crop of finger millet, which is dark green and is doing so well. But you know, they are getting the same amount of rain, which then proves why finger millet is, is better than maize. Next. Our mission um, is to inspire and support the communities transition to the livelihoods that are based on self-sustaining approaches. We, we achieve this by embracing agroecological practices and the various um, methods, Sorry. Um, mitigating the adverse effects of climate change. Most of the problems we believe are caused by climate change. And I remember when I was young and growing up, um, we were getting more rain than what we are getting now. And the, there was no shortage of food um, in our area, as it is now. And uh, this includes land, livestock, regeneration, and the biofertilizers, and, and um, cultivating of small grains. Other than finger millet, we also look at other small grains, like pig, pill millet, um, and sorghum. We really would want Chinyika to become a model for Masingo province and a model for Zimbabwe and possibly for, for Africa. We promote deep and thoughtful care for the communities and, and the cultural recourse based. Okay, we promote needs best regenerative and integrated land use practices. And really, what we are saying here is um, we use agroecological methodologies, uh, eco friendly farming methodologies, which we have discovered that they, they really are good for our people, they would help us <clears throat> survive and mitigate um, the effects of climate change. That's what we are doing. And we say we eat what we grow, therefore ensure that the food that we eat <clears throat> is organically grown and it is nutrition, nutritious. If you look at that, people are being fed. It is at a field day where we had farmers coming to see the good work that has been done by a farmer. Most of that food in that plate is locally grown and very nutritious. And the, the dark part in that plate is um, finger millet porridge, or we call it sadza, very nutritious. Finger millet has everything the human body needs in terms of nutrition. That, that one is an example of finger millet um, field, which has been fed um, of kettle manure, goat manure, and compost manure. It's slightly yellowish. Uh, it, 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 it shows that maybe it is lacking uh, minerals, unlike the one that is fed by Bokashi, which is more balanced and it is everything you would have the dark green color. And the principles that we, we, we apply and practice in the Chinika, crop diversity, low tillage or no tillage. We integrate animals, 
uh, with our activity and um, use of biomaterial, organic matter additions, local seeds, pest control, um, and no use of uh, chemicals. Low tillage or no till. You can see that that lady is Mrs. Mlambo. She is in a field. Um, they, there's been no till, but they cleared the grass, the, the ground cover. And she, she is really digging holes to, to plant the seeds. We integrate animals. In terms of our culture, a master farmer is known by having um, a diversity of animals, goats, cattle, um, chicken, and so on. And really, especially cattle, they play a very important role in our lives. We use them for um, land preparation. We sell them to make money. We get milk from them. We get meat from them. And if a farmer doesn't have cattle, he's not a farmer at all. And in this picture, you can see the, 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 the animals in a controlled grazing um, uh, grazing area. You can see where the animals are and there's a picture where the land has been left to recover or we call it, that one is the second paddock. Uh, the grazing areas are divided into paddocks, one, two, three, in some cases up to nine, in some cases up to 10 and so on. And other paddocks are left to grow grass and they move the cattle around and, and manage that way. We've also discovered that when the ticks do not have a host for at least two weeks, they die. And the areas that are not grazed and that are left to on, on their own um, will have no ticks. And that way we can control the ticks. use of biofertilizer. You can see in one of the pictures, farmers are taught to make biofertilizer called Bokashi. And that is in, 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 in his head. It, it was one of the occasions when he came to the picture of green finger doing so well. And the other one is a picture of maize, which has been fed of Sorry, Paul, it uh, looks like your connection is uh, breaking. Uh, hello, Paul, can you hear me? Can you hear me? It looks like your connection is uh, breaking. Maybe there's a problem with your internet. Yeah, I think it was our network, which was a problem. Okay, please continue. You have about okay. uh, five minutes. You can uh, okay. five minutes. Okay. Finish up. Come on. Let's share the screen. Not. Okay. Use um um organic uh, paste control measure, organically uh, produced uh, pest control um, measures. Thank you, the next one. Next. We encourage our, 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 our farmers not to use uh, chemicals at all, especially chemical fertilizers and the chemical pesticides. The challenge is no till or low tillage. We found it um, to be a lot, a lot challenging for the, for the farmers. 
because we've got some perennial grasses which, which grow throughout the year and they've got very deep roots. If you don't till, then um, they grow faster than the crops and they take all the food, all the food from the crops. Thank you. Use of bio um, mat mat materials. We use um, bokashi and the kettle manure. And you can see in those, those two crops, one bokashi, one um, kettle manure. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, uh, sorry for uh, your connectivity problems and maybe yeah. just a quick one. Yeah, even our uh, slide, uh, our slide operation was yeah. a bit chaotic here. Thank you, sorry about that. Okay, welcome. Um, just a quick one. You have uh, mentioned the eight uh, principles of natural farming. And if you could just pick uh, two that you are effectively um, doing. You've mentioned in your presentation, uh, one of them as bio materials or the bio stimulants as one of the best, which other one? Okay. Um, when it comes to bio material, we, we use um, organic um, meta, organic, uh, fertilizers such as our kettle manure and compost manure um, and other organic um, materials. That is what we encourage most farmers to do. Um, Biofet um, like Bokashi, we are still experimenting on it. We're still learning how to use it. There are correct amounts to apply, but um, it is catching up very well. It's becoming very popular with the farmers and so on. As you could see, uh, where it has been applied properly, it has really produced very good results. It produces very good results, especially in vegetable gardens. We have got nutrition gardens for the families, and uh, it has done so well um, on, on that. Uh, thank you. I think uh, what I'm reading and uh, also seeing uh, comments on the, how effective Bokashi uh, is being used. And uh, is there anything that uh, you have tried from uh, uh, the Indian uh, presentation, from the Andhra Pradesh presentation? And uh, maybe if you have tried, uh, what do you think um, are the, the, the principles that you have been promoting in relation to how they have uh, also been promoting uh, in terms of success? Um, not, we are in the process of, of, of learning how to do it, but uh, what we have started doing is the pelleting of seeds. Uh, our farmers are experimenting on the pelleting of seeds. Um, we are in the middle of our rain season now, and, and, but the next cropping is when we would try to use the seeds that have been uh, pelleted, and, and we hope we are going to get good results. Okay, thank you, thank you with that. And then another quick one, you've um, really emphasized on uh, finger millet as um, a staple uh, uh, crop uh, in your region. And uh, is there any other um, uh, crops, vegetables that go with the finger millet and uh, how are they um, uh, produced? Sure, it's vegetables, yes. We've got, um, because to have a complete and a balanced meal, you need your starch, you need vegetables, you need your, you need your meat or protein. Um, and we use goat meat, um, we use chicken meat, um, in some cases, kettle meat um, and vegetables. We have what we call nutrition gardens where we grow a variety of vegetables. So in a meal, a balanced meal, you will have your vegetables, I like, you know, which would have um, used onion, spinach, and so on. We also have indigenous vegetables, like the leaves from cow peas um, and the leaves from pumpkins. They are also used. And it also depends on how they are made. 
and how the finger millet um, uh, uh, starch part of it is cooked and prepared. Um, it can be very tasty. And, and, um, and if it's done properly, you would thoroughly enjoy it. Uh, thank you. Maybe a last one here is that uh, you, you, you have in uh, finger millet uh, a single or um, a monocrop. Uh, what is the, the feeling of uh, uh, the people on integrating uh, other crops within uh, the same fields as was uh, shown uh, in the Indian uh, um, diversity uh, principle? Yes, if you see on, the, on that slide, it, it you're right, on your right, there's finger millet and there's a maize um, you know, uh, crop there. And um, they, they, um, there is a diversity. In this, in this plot, you will have about seven or eight other crops. Like there's cowpeas, there's um, ground nuts, there's also round nuts and so on. Um, that's, what, that's what we encourage farmers to do. So that at least they utilize maximum use of the land and they get nearly everything they need from that piece of land. And so when they put food on the table, it is a reflection of a diversity of crops which they grow, which they have. In this case, there's your vegetables from the garden. Um, there's also your um, pumpkin leaves, um, which, which are also part of the meal. In that picture, you can see a diversity of crops, not just finger millet, but um, other crops as well. And we also encourage intercropping as part of um, pest control and so on. Uh, thank you. Then uh, uh, Matt uh, had a question. Matt, could you just uh, maybe ask uh, Paul, maybe if you could uh, just bring that question out? Yeah, thanks, Paul. Really interesting um, presentation. We talked a bit last time about the problems of um, pelleting seed. And I'm wondering at what scale you're pelleting your seed, whether it's mechanized or by hand, and, and if you're able to do it for somebody planting at scale. Right, we, we are just starting on this one. What we have done so far is using our hands to, to pellet the seeds. Um, we don't have the equipment to mechanize it, but maybe as we progress, eventually, maybe we can uh, mechanize it. But currently we're experimenting on using our hands. Thank you. And uh, we had another clarification uh, from Ross. Uh, Ross, would you, could you just uh, uh, ask your question? You, you have a chance to ask Paul. Ross Ndashimie. Yes, um, thank you so much. Um, I wanted to know uh, how, uh, how you mentioned, um, um, Paul, you mentioned that you are encouraging farmers to um, like not use synthetic fertilizers. How are they responding to that? I was asking because in our context, like you find that the government is encouraging like more synthetic fertilizer use and some people are already addicted to that <laughs> to some degree. Or not. So, how, how are farmers responding to that? And are they seeing a difference um, when they use like a much better, like a much better yield when they they don't use synthetic fertilizers? How uh, how, how is that working out? Sure, very very good question. Our major challenge is when the government gives out uh, um, uh, what we call uh, uh, handouts to the farmers, uh, which include. Uh, fertilizers and, and seed packs. But uh, our farmers, we've gone through our, our exposure and our, through our training center and so on. They now can see the benefits of using non-chemical fertilizers. And they can see that the, the chemical fertilizers have destroyed the soil over the years and you can't grow anything on those soils. And the best way to heal the soil is to use your organic fertilizers, biofertilizer, uh, cattle manure, compost manure, and so on. And uh, these are with very good results. Besides, chemical fertilizers cost money and they cost a lot of money. Other than if you get it from the government for free, uh, which, which is not always the case, 
um, organic fertilizers are the cheapest way to regenerate the soil, to fertilize your soil and so on. And it's catching up with the farmers because it's all for free. Uh, and when they use their cattle to fertilize the soil in what we call the moving bomber, you know, you concentrate the, the cattle in one place overnight and you do it for seven days, you move them to one, another place and so on. That is produced very, very good results. And it's fertilized or organic fertilized for free. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Then uh, our last one here, you've uh, mentioned a lot about the finger millets. Do you have any results of the yields? And then uh, how much organic uh, manure are you using per hectare? Yes, um, we, we really normally don't do it in a very scientific and a measuring way. Um, you, you just look at what we have. And um, going by experience, you know, most of our indigenous knowledge is passed on from generation to generation. Um, what you have and how much you can uh, put on a piece of land that you have also depends on um, the number of cattle that you have to produce the amounts of um, cattle manure that you may need and so on. And you can supplement it by making compost manure and, and, and so on. Um, and we, we, we are using common sense. Um, that's what we normally do. And Thank this you. has really uh, come up with very, very good results. Uh, thank you. Then uh, you will have a supplementary one. I think you will also answer that uh, on the chat, uh, whether you've had any challenges as you are implementing the nine principles, especially with uh, uh, the government or experience with the uh, uh, government extension uh, policy or officers. But that uh, is just some assignment. Maybe you will uh, be able to respond on the chat. Uh, thank you, Paul and a great uh, presentation. And uh, now we get to our last uh, presentation, last but not least. I hope, uh, Paul, you are ready from uh, Groundswell and um, you are most welcome. It's Twamba, Twamba. Sorry, sorry, it's uh, Twamba, Twamba. Uh, thank you for the correction, John. Uh, Twamba, are you there? Yes. Thank you very most, much. Most welcome. Okay. Would you like to share the presentation, please? Uh, if you have any internet uh, problem, then I'll ask Ma Matt, please, if you can uh, have Twamba's uh, uh, presentation on the screen. Okay. Just working on it. Because my connection is a bit weak. It may break. Yep. Okay, okay. Um, as uh, the connection is being done, uh, Rose, you have the floor. You can explain uh, about the manures and how, what you are encountering with the government. Yes, thanks, for Ferdinand. Um, as I hear, like these, um, these are awesome presentations and like the applications of what we have learned so far. I uh, had two questions. One, um, as you are applying some of these nine principles, uh, sometimes you know, the way of farming in Andhra Pradesh and some is a little bit different from the conventional way of farming. So as uh, you have applied this, organizations that are presented have presented and those that will do in the future, is there a time that you faced like issues <laughs> when, um, especially when what you are applying is not uh, has not been applied into the local context and how, how have you dealt with such a situation, especially when it includes like a training of farmers and farmers changing the way they are doing things, uh, which will go against the, what the local extension officers will, will be um, uh, recommending. How, how have you dealt, uh, how do you deal with such to really have adoption? Uh, thanks, Paul. Uh, the other thing is was that I was curious about is um, in places where there is not a lot of cattle, a lot of animals. Uh, here in our country, we don't have a lot of. Some communities don't have a lot of 
cattle, but still we want to really go away from using some synthetic fertilizers and use biostimulants. Uh, has anyone really seen something, some things that can help such communities and continue applying the, the principles, but, but in a context where there is not a lot of animals? Um, Thank you, thank you, thank you, Rosine. I think we'll get back to those uh, questions and uh, I have some discussion after uh, Tomba's uh, presentation. And uh, thank you, Matt. I think I can see uh, Tomba's uh, presentation on the screen. And uh, please uh, continue, uh, mm, Tomba. Okay, thank you very much. I'm glad to present uh, to to you the experience, experience of uh, international. Um, Grantswell International is a network of, of uh, local organizations uh, across the world, especially in Latin America, West Africa, and Asia. Next, please. So it consists of regional network of local organizations and their grassroots communities, group partners, and allies. Founded in uh, 2009, it works currently in 10 countries in West Africa and uh, Americas and South Asia, as I said earlier. Its mission is to strengthen the capacity of women, communities, and farmers' organizations to create healthy farming and food system from the bottom up. Next, in West Africa, you can see in, on the map where we work, Senegal, Burkina Faso, Mali, and Ghana, where 60 small-scale farmers are living in ecologically fragile, climatic, climate vulnerable areas growing sorghum, millet, and cowpeas. We enable rural communities to make a transition to transform their farming and food system through agroecology. Next. So the challenges we face in general is uh, poor management of uh, natural resources, people to crash and burn, using wildfires, freeze grazing, livestock, and the land is degraded due to reduced following and soil fertility collapse. In addition, the climate change leading to increasing temperature, limited and erratic rainfall, scarce water for farming, and high level of food insecurity and malnutrition, especially for children and pregnant or lactating women. Gender inequity, women have limited access to decision making power and resources. We also face uh, political insecurity and violence, especially in Burkina Faso and Mali. On the, on the image on the rest, or on the right, you can see how to use their land and burn to prepare their uh, cultivation. And uh, below you see uh, the deserts with uh, how the dust uh, goes up with the wind, especially when winds come. Next, please. Okay, fortunately, there are also opportunities and uh, we still have land and natural resources, even if they are not uh, 
good in general. Almost all part, uh, households, including women, can access land. And yes, but usually degraded and small plots. Community solidarity and volunteer champion farmer ready to test new practices and help their neighbors learn how to improve food and nutrition security through agriculture and off farm livelihoods. We also have local authorities uh, responsible for local development plans. It used to be the case in all the countries, but for uh, now, I mean, in Mali and Burkina Faso, difficulties, political difficulties, things are, have changed a bit, but we still hope uh, local authorities will be there and help plan for uh, the area's development. There are also local leaders willing to collaborate with other stakeholders for impact. And small farmer organization exists in most villages, including some umbrella federation, and also some support NGOs still work in the areas. On the images, you can see people trying to uh, prepare their land with half moon above and below the same half, uh, half moon uh, after uh, people grow uh, sorghum and after the rain. You can see how it sustains water. Next, please. What we do, do we do in response to the challenges? Next. So the images are showing the various uh, techniques uh, we are trying to promote in the areas. We are trying to promote transition from conventional to more sustainable and resilient farming system, meaning soil and water conservation, farmer managed natural resources of trees, crop rotation and association. So in the first row of images, you can see the first image is about uh, a femina uh, cultivating uh, cereals uh, in a farm with where trees are present. The half moon is the second, and the stone bounds is uh, the third image and the last one above is uh, composting. We see two types of compost. Compost. Crop rotation is in the row below the first image and we see uh, crop associations, um, sorghum and uh, leguminous crops. And the next image is a training session where you see people preparing compost. And the last one is what we call zai holes, where we put seeds to grow crop, a uh, small plot where we can catch water when the soil is very hard. Okay, on the EQT side, we try to classify households according to their uh, wealth level and uh, using local uh, criteria. And uh, we, tailor, we tailor our support, generally uh, mean uh, sensitization and training is for everybody. But when it comes to material gifts, we usually select vulnerable household and prioritize them. Here we can see, uh, donation of rotational uh, animal uh, rearing. We used to give to women animals. When it gives birth, we take the, 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 the small and give to another women, so on and so on. 
it can spread to uh, all the women in the same village. I mean, vulnerable women. Next, please. Okay, women empowerment is another area of activity in uh, our system. Uh, leadership, organization, and increased access to mean of production. Mean of production for women, it means uh, land, water, knowledge, capital. So we support women uh, access to secure land and uh, also provide them support to put in place uh, market gardening sites where they can grow vegetable and other uh, crops they want. And uh, we also improve income and livelihood uh, through uh, revolving livestock we've seen in the previous uh, slide, but also processing and selling of non-timber forest products, grain reserve, what we call orantashia, and help women for selling and food. And here you can see a group of women counting the money they were able to save. Next, please. Yeah, here's uh, uh, one way of improving the food system. Uh, processing and sale of non-timber forest products, drying vegetables, nutrient, nutrition dense crops, improve access to local markets. Here you can see people, uh, women, that were able to process uh, shea butter and uh, other local uh, tree products. Nice. Uh... Nice, nice uh, presentation. Uh, just to yes. manage our. We also our... deal with uh, nutrition. Hello, Tomba. Uh, because usually people think that nutrition is about uh, uh, people work, uh, health services uh, task, but we think uh, in Grant's world that it's better to prevent malnutrition using various strategies uh, in the farm. So we promote cultivation of nutrient dense crops, awareness raising and training on balanced diets, encouraging people to uh, eat diversify, diversified uh, meals to prevent uh, people uh, falling into malnutrition. Next, please. Uh, sorry, sorry, Tomba, for uh, an interruption. Huh? Okay. The yeah. last main Hello. area where we Hello. work is about uh, enabling environment for uh, agroecology. We use to uh, support citizen advocacy for supporting policy and programs, training in participatory local development planning with local government, and documenting and disseminating results. Here you can see it's a uh, a caravan of uh, local governance and technical services going into the field and see uh, what farmers are implementing. Here is a harmon where they grow uh, sorghum. So uh, this is some, a way for us to show to decision makers how effective are agroecological innovation. So when the time comes for the farmers to go to them for advocacy, they already know what it is about it and usually it works. Next, please. So this is our outreach data. Uh, now we are working in four countries, one partner in each country, so four of them. And uh, we also have a grassroots organization working with uh, in-country partners. We have 468 of them. And the communities, we work in uh, 537 villages. And farmer improving agroecology is more than uh, 80,000. And hectares on AE production is more than 
125,000. The direct beneficiaries are uh, 80, more than 80,000. Uh, and direct beneficiaries, 335,000. And total, which total is more than 400. Next, please. Uh, sorry, sorry, Tomba. Just a short interruption. We are limited of uh, coming short of time. Uh, okay. Uh, kindly, yeah, kindly, if you could just okay. get to your slide number. Please, just one second. Okay. Okay. To conclude. Okay. Okay. You can wind up from your slide number eighteen on the natural practices. Uh, okay. Okay. So the. Two principles we uh, where we are a bit strong is uh, crop diversity and local seeds, and where we are still uh, struggling is about organic uh, organic matter adding, pest management, and soil coverage and no tillage. And what we see as relevant to apply in our area, but is not yet strong, is about using birth stimulant to improve soil. So the next one, please go next. Next. Next again. Next. Okay. So uh, we wanted to share uh, farmer managed natural resource regeneration. That is, according to us, something that is not uh, uh, widespread in uh, some other areas uh, we used to go, and we don't see it as much done in the Andhra Pradesh experience. So we wanted to sh share uh, about this, but even time is uh, up, we just uh, show some comments. I say it's a way of selecting uh, trees and uh, pruning the branches to diminish. So pruning to, to diminish the shade, which allow the farmer to grow crop under trees without uh, the bad effect of the cheese. Next, please. This is an example. Next, please. Here you see uh, crops with trees, with no problem. Next, please. Okay, this is a way to show that the, eff the effectiveness of uh, FMNR to fight against the increase of temperature. In the shade, you have low temperature and uh, outside it's uh, high. Okay, next please. Th this is our example. And uh, on, the, on the left, you can see that even the trees have deep roots, they can pull the water and feed the cereals, usually at night, at night time. Okay, these are example of uh, crop together with trees. Next. This is one other benefit from FMNR. People, uh, women can get firewood from it when it's pruned. Next. Okay, here we can see uh, in in Mali, the uh, Sahel Eco has a very good experience on transforming barren land to an uh, area with a lot of trees. So the, it, it's more or less the same area before and after, very close. The two places are 500 meters apart. Okay, next please. So increase of production. Next. 
So the challenge is, is we still face is that uh, land, it's required land preparation and it's really, uh, tree tenure because the land, uh, the trees, the regulation about trees exploitation in some countries is not easy. And we also have a uh, fire, wildfire that can destroy it, and animals are not uh, keep, kept uh, on spot, so it also can destroy it. And community bylaw control, tree cutting, and fill with strong bushes, bushes may not be available in certain areas. So we also need women engagement on that. Next, please. So thank you very much for your attention. Sorry for being too long. Great, great. You got uh, very nice uh, pictures and uh, thank you for uh, all the three uh, presentations and just maybe a short one from uh, Twamba. Um, if you could just, uh, um, uh, share what is uh, your relationship with the uh, government in uh, places where you are promoting these uh, uh, practices. Uh, that was uh, a continuation of part of the discussion raised by Rosin. Just a very short one, please, uh, one minute, and then I'll give uh, Richard okay. also an opportunity. We, okay. you, thank you. We used to work in close collaboration with uh, local When we come to, uh, you can't hear me? Yeah, it seems like you're having an internet okay. problem. So I say we use to work closely with government because what we do is in support of the action. And to make sure that we have their support, we involve them at the beginning of the action and we take them to the field from time to time to see how the activity and effect are evolving. And then we share experience with them and we support farmers in advo to advocate their case with them. Thank you. Then we had uh, Richard, if you just make uh, one comment on uh, relationship with the government, and then I will uh, give the microphone to Stephanie also to make her comment, maybe her last, I mean, our last comment before we can uh, wind up our, our sharing today. Welcome, Richard. Richard Bambavo, you had some comment? Then uh, maybe if he's not uh, ready, or I don't know, he's left. Stephanie, please. Uh, uh, thanks very much, Ferdinand. Um, I think overall, on the, from the three presentations, um, I'm very impressed by how these organizations and the farmers they work with are already taken up so many of the of the principles, um, and and I think there's also commonalities in the challenges uh, that they face. So I think it's it's good because then we can also work together towards addressing those challenges. Um, and for me also what I, I, I will keep for, especially Southern Africa and, and the partners in Southern Africa, the Sky Partners, it's maybe really to start really um, uh, developing a research program uh, to, to, to start um, uh, documenting all those trials and, and start providing evidence, especially to convince more extension offices as uh, the, the, the chats that we had with uh, Rosine, uh, so that we can we can even continue promoting further this um, this agroecology practices. So so yeah, no. Once again, very much impressed, uh, and we also look forward to getting comments uh, from from our Indian colleagues. Um, and impressions on how we're doing in Africa. Thanks. Hey, thank you so much, uh, Stephanie. Um, we had uh, many comments and uh, I think uh, participants also wanted to have access to the presentations. And uh, John, you have any comment on that? 
Yeah, so anyone who wants the presentations, just let me have the email. I've got the ones from the chat here. Uh, it's, it, they're big and they have to go via WeTransfer. So I'm not, it's for those who want. So the, the, the recording will go out to everybody, uh, but those who want, and I'll, I'll make a note in the email as well there to say if anybody wants the presentations to, uh, to let me know and then I can send them individually. It doesn't uh, email, if you try and send uh, large documents to and on groups, they don't go through. So it needs to be done individually. Thank you. Uh, John, we also recognize uh, some uh, participants here. Marian uh, specifically was interested in the presentation. And welcome, Marian. If you have uh, any comment about uh, the presentation, uh, just for a minute before we can uh, wind up our time. Yeah, thank you so much. I mean, it's been very, very interesting listening to different presentations from Samba, from every other person that has spoken. I'm, I mean, it's, I don't know why I missed the first section. It's like a whole new school, learning again and being motivated to, this thing can work. We can actually grow our crops without these poisons and this toxicity they, they're making us to believe. I wish we can get more people to join us next sections. Everybody needs to hear this and thank you so much for facilitating this, the organizers, everybody who has turned up. Thank you so much. Please let this learning continue forever. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne. And uh, I think we've uh, kept the time and uh, our next session is uh, on the 10th of March and uh, please uh, Stay connected and uh, share with others about these good practices on natural farming. And we'll share the next steps, I think, as we get to the tent. And uh, any uh, tip, John, on uh, the next organizations uh, for the 10th of uh, March? Yes, we've got uh, Turo the uh, Chimani Mani from Chimani Mani district in Zimbabwe. Uh, it's a district that covers from very dry to wetter. Uh, and we have Rosine is here with us from Rwanda. So we'll have a presentation from uh, Ms. Bridge for Rwanda, that, their organization. And then we have another one from someone with ICRAF in Rwanda. So we've got two presentations from Rwanda next time. So this is, it, it, it might link a bit to the FMNR uh, idea, the, the presentation from the ICRAF person in Rwanda. So we've got three, three more, our last three presentations for this phase, but there will be more presentations after that. Great, please stay connected. And I think our next sessions are going to be um, also more interesting. And uh, I just request everyone, if uh, possible, just open your video sharing and just say bye or say hi to everybody else. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Merci Thank beaucoup. You. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And uh, see you uh, on the 10th. Best yeah. wishes. Okay. Yeah, share with anyone who you think might be interested in this, this work on from the ground. Thank you so much. This is so great. Thank you so much, everybody. Bye.